bringing the people behind our food to life. And there it is. That is the remnant of the, of the seed right there. And you can see there's no pit. Luther Burbank one time re, uh, received a plum, a, that is a form of Prunus domestica, that was called sans noyau. If, you, if I'm pronouncing it right, I don't know if my French is good. But the thing that was unusual about it was instead of having an entire stone, it had about a half a stone. It was as though somebody had cut half of the stone off and just left the kernel sticking out of a half a stone. And he thought, well, maybe that could be used to breed a stoneless plum. So he crossed it with commercial plums of the day, like, like the old prune de agent, and he began to look for seedlings in there that had less stone on them than that one original parent. And he selected plants out eventually that had no stone in them at all. They sometimes would have a kernel. They'd have the seed kernel looking like a little apricot or a little almond seedling, seed, excuse me, but no actual stony material. Unfortunately, in, the, in those days, prune growers were paid by the pound. And a, a prune without a pit weighed less, so they made less money on a pitless prune than they, they would have otherwise, so they, they weren't popular, plus the fact that a lot of these really were not perfected. They would have a, instead of having a completely empty seed cavity, in some years they'd have little bits of stony material that were gritty, and were in some ways almost worse than a pit, because you can spit out a pit, but you can't spit out these little bits, you're a little more likely to bite into them and start cracking them in your teeth. So the stoneless plums pretty much died out and it was more or less thought that they were extinct at one time. And in 19, about 69 or so, when I was going to Oregon State University, Dr. Maxine Thompson told me that she had found a tree of stoneless plums on a farm in Salem, Oregon. And I went there and saw it and it definitely was, was one of the stoneless plums. It was probably one that Luther Burbank had sold to the old Oregon nursery company sometime near 1900 or in the early 1910s and sometime in there. And the fellow who had the tree said he found it growing in a fence row. He was an orchardist and so he took this tree out of the fence row and he planted it in his orchard in a mixed prune orchard. And when I say prunes I mean European type plums not Japanese type plums. So the next spring when it bloomed, I went out and, and prote put protecting cages over a bunch of the limbs and crossed a lot of them with apricots and I left a lot of them open to pollination by all the other prunes in the, in the orchard. The idea with crossing with apricots was that I had gotten pollen of an apricot that had a sweet edible kernel, thinking that it would be interesting to get a, get a fruit with an edible with no stone, but with an edible kernel in it. You'd have a prune, prune pre-stuffed with a nut, so to speak. So I crossed it with these sweet kernel to apricots. I had gotten pollen from eastern Washington. And in due course, I got six seedlings out of it. And at the same time, as a comparison, I grew what were known as open pollinated seedlings, that is, uh, fruit that was resulting just from being crossed with the other prunes in the orchard. And the true hybrid seedlings, the true crosses between the prune and the apricot were such weaklings that they only got to be a few inches tall and then they died. I found out later that the roots were weak and that if I had known that in time I could have grafted them onto something else and they might have survived to grow them out and see what they do, but I didn't know that at the time. I was not far enough along in my horticulture in those days. In any case, I still had a group of open pollinated seedlings as I call them and I planted them out, and they're slow to come into bearing. Most prunes take, can take 10 to 12 years to come into bearing from seed, so they're slow. And the, the tree on my right, that is on my right, it would be in the viewer's left, is a seedling, and the one to the other side of me is actually a grafted tree of the original stoneless plum tree, which in the intervening years is gone now. But the stoneless plum how, well, how do you reproduce a stoneless plum? Well, of course, you can graft it. That always will reproduce it exactly. But if you pollinate an ordinary prune with a stoneless plum, you will get a certain percentage of the offspring that will be stoneless. You can also grow seedlings from the stoneless one because not every fruit in it is stoneless. That is to say, it has, it's, it has a kernel in it. Some of the seeds, or some of the fruits, as you'll see, will have no, 
no seed in them at all. They'll just have a little wrinkled up seed remnant and some of them will have a normal seed kernel in them. If you take those seed kernels out and protect them, you can grow them into trees and some of the trees will have the stoneless characteristic in them. There's more to the breeding than that, but that's the essential idea of it is the way you can produce another stoneless plum from it. And this one on this side here is one that has about as, the same degree of stonelessness as the original tree that I found, but it's a bigger fruit and a little better quality. Now there's more, a, a lot more to the story to this because it happens that there's a group of USDA researchers in Kearneysville, West Virginia that have in the last couple of years, the last year or two, have been starting research on stoneless plum material. And somebody who knew I had a stoneless plum sent me the word of their research and I contacted them and asked them where they had gotten their material. And they had, and when I, when I looked it up, it turned out that all but one source were people that had gotten their signs originally from me, from when I had been sending out signs of this one original stoneless plum tree. So all of it traced back to this one original tree in Salem that I had, that Dr. Maxine Thompson had first found and that I had worked with. Well, I wrote to them and I told them of these seedlings and they were quite excited about it because it meant that I had material that was much older than anything they were doing with their research and they were quite, and they were interested in seeing about it. So I've been sending them seeds and I've sent them fruit samples and leaf samples for DNA testing and I'm still waiting to hear back on the DNA results. But they have found already now that this stoneless plum characteristic appears to exist uh, in a lot of plums but without being expressed because they can grow seedlings of many different plum varieties and a fair number of them will produce a partly stoneless offspring. So apparently this gene is more widely distributed than we thought and they do believe now that they, after studying this characteristic, they, they believe that they can transfer this gene to other stone fruits so that eventually it might be possible, for example, to have stoneless peaches or other stoneless stone fruit. Basically what I want to get is a long straight side that will come in contact with the cambium. 